220 AD, the Great Wall. 1420, the Forbidden City. 1997, Three Gorges Dam. 2002, China does it again. Chinese engineers and workers tackle one of the biggest construction projects on Earth. In the middle of the ocean. The biggest possible piece of infrastructure that they could possibly build. Welcome to Yangshan, on track to become the biggest deep water port ever built. A 20 kilometer key with 50 berths, over 30 kilometers out to sea. Linked to China by the world's second longest ocean bridge where massive cranes, a cutting-edge control system and some very, very focused personnel are already shattering records for loading and unloading gigantic container ships. Battling for supremacy in the world's biggest import-export trade and Yang Shen's not even close to being finished. Spring 2007, the Gudrun Maersk, one of the largest container ships on Earth, sails 32 kilometers off the Chinese coast. Her deck stacked high with 3,000 shipping containers, a multi-million dollar cargo. And 32 kilometers out at sea, the crew of the Gudrun Maersk is just about to put it all overboard. At one of the biggest cargo facilities on Earth. The Yangshan Deepwater Container Port. It'll be years before this mega port is finished, but Yangshan's docks are already over three kilometers long. On those docks, some of the world's biggest and brawniest cranes, high tech trucks, one of the most advanced control systems at any container port and some of the best container port operators in the business are getting ready for the Gudrun Maersk. They'll have a good day's work ahead of them and they'll have less than a day to do it. From the moment this giant ship docks, they'll have just 20 hours to unload her 3,000 shipping containers and load her up with 2,000 more. Then they'll have to move the 3,000 unloaded containers to the mainland, over 32 kilometers of open sea. And there's no room for error. Every ship, every day, Yangshan's battling powerful rivals for supremacy in a billion dollar business. Shanghai. China's biggest city and the world's busiest cargo port. In the 21st century, China's export-import trades exploding by nearly 30% per year. And Shanghai's in the right place at the right time. Located about halfway down the Chinese coast, right at the point where the Yangtze, the world's third largest river, empties into the sea. Billions of dollars of goods made in China travel down the Yangtze to be shipped abroad. In 2001, that was 300 million tons of cargo. By 2005, it was nearly 800 million. Shanghai should be sitting pretty. But it's got problems. Big problems. Problems these two guys deal with every day. Wu Jiang Wen and Jiang Wei are Shanghai Harbour Pilots. Hey, 
Their job, climb on board cargo ships arriving from the open sea and steer them to a safe berth at Shanghai's docks. And that's even harder than you think. The color of the sea reveals why. Muddy brown, the color of a river. Every year, millions of tons of silt wash down the Yangtze River and into the sea. Where the Yangtze meets the ocean, all that silt piles up in sandbars. Exactly where hundreds of ships are sailing into Shanghai. At low tide, the silted up entrance to the world's busiest cargo port is only seven meters deep. And in today's world, any ship that can clear seven meters is a mere rowboat. The biggest ships that come into Shanghai need 12 meters water depth. So they are very dependent on high tide. So when we go in or out of port, we have to pay very careful attention to the height of the tide. Today's vessel needs only eight meters depth. It cleared the sandbars at high tide. But that doesn't mean Wu Zhang Wen and Zhang Wei are having a nice day. They look relaxed, but they know their problems are just beginning. Because Shanghai's aquatic arteries are seriously clogged with more than just silt. Their ships now entering the Huangpu, a smaller river that runs through Shanghai. And they're about to steer it through one of the worst maritime traffic jams on earth. Normally, we'll have more than 100 ships coming into the river mouth and another 100 ships going out over 24 hours. And that's just the big ships over 5,000 tons. I'm not even counting the smaller ones. It is not a simple matter of one ship following another. There are ports all along the river. Ships have to cut across traffic, so there is a lot of risk. Shipping expert Matthew Flynn compares sailing up the Huangpu to commuting to work in the middle of the Indianapolis 500. It's probably one of the most exciting and memorable uh, journeys that any ship captain can make. That doesn't mean that he's looking forward to it. It's probably the most challenging uh, port entrance there is in Asia. And believe it or not, there's more. If you measure the Huangpu River bank to bank, it's 400 meters wide. But our two pilots know they're working with a lot less. The navigable waterway, the waterway that's deep enough, is fewer than 300 meters wide. In some places, it's only a bit more than 200 meters. And that worries Shanghai pilots, because a moving ship needs a distance three to five times its length to turn around. To avoid a collision, a 100 meter long ship will need 300 to 500 meters. And on the Huangpu, it isn't going to get it. For instance, the ship we're on today is 145 meters long. So when it comes into the river, it can't turn itself around. And ships don't have brakes like cars do. If you slow a ship down to avoid a collision, you can't steer it. It would just drift out of control. So if there is an emergency, there is nothing I can do. That's why everybody's glad when the tugboats finally take over and push the ship into the dock. <laughs> Because to these guys, a cruise up the Huangpu is about as relaxing as steering a runaway truck through a crowded shopping mall. Shanghai's navigation challenges make life interesting for Wu Zhanwen and Jiang Wei. But why should they be a big problem for Shanghai? After all, Shanghai's been a world-class port for decades. All that time, the Yangtze was choking the silt and the Huangpu was never much wider. So what's changed? 
this has. The size of the ships sailing into Shanghai. Gigantic container ships. The most cost-effective way to move enormous quantities of freight around the planet. If they can't get their cargoes in and out of Shanghai, Shanghai can't give the world what it needs. Ships will go elsewhere, and Shanghai will be left behind. After World War II, shipping containers revolutionized the cargo industry. Unlike loose cargo, packed containers could simply be offloaded onto waiting trucks and driven away. The first ships carried only a few dozen containers. It didn't take a shipping genius to realize that the more containers one ship could carry per voyage, the more money ship owners would make. So container ships got bigger, and bigger, and bigger. Well, if you're making $1,000 per container that you're hauling across the ocean, and it's a dollar and cents type of equation. The bigger ships you can, that you can build, uh, the more cargo that you can carry. In the 1990s, Shanghai built new container ports at Waigao Chao, on the ocean just beyond the mouth of the Yangtze. Ships docking at Waigao Chao didn't have to sail up the Huangpu, and the water there was over 12 meters deep. For a time, things seemed fine, but then the ships got even bigger. As big as the Gudrun Maersk, over 40 meters wide, over 300 meters long, longer than the Eiffel Tower, and needing deeper water than Waigao Chao could offer. Even at 12.5 meters, that's not really deep enough for the biggest ships. We're talking 9,000, 10,000, 13,000 TU container ships. So you really want something that's at least 15 meters. Today's mega ships like the Gudrun Maersk are in a class by themselves. A class called Post Panamax because they're too wide to fit through the Panama Canal. And they're also too big for Shanghai. Steering a 350 meter long vessel up the traffic choked Guangpu isn't the best idea. And the Huangpu's 400 meter wide channel isn't much wider than the Gudrun Maersk is long. Turning would be a nightmare. And in the early 1990s, Shanghai gave the world's biggest ships something else to worry about. Two suspension bridges spanning the Huangpu. If a big ship came in, it could not pass under the Huangpu Bridge. Only ships of 48 meters tall or under can pass under that bridge. In the 21st century, 30% of the world's shipping containers were traveling on post Panamax vessels. And Shanghai still wasn't deep enough, wide enough, or big enough to let those ships come in. Problems competing ports like Hong Kong and Singapore didn't have. As China's economy exploded, everyone wanted a piece of the action. If Shanghai couldn't handle the business, it would have gone elsewhere. 2002, Shanghai's leaders rolled the dice on a bold solution. At a place called Yangshan, 32 kilometers offshore, where the water was 15 to 20 meters deep. Today, Yangshan is a large island that can easily accommodate a world-class container port. But when Shanghai's engineers chose it, over 60% of it didn't exist. Yangshan was just what nature made it, a collection of tiny islands, with no room for anything but a fishing village. Engineers considered creating flat land by leveling the hills, but decided against destroying Yangshan's natural topography. Instead, they decided to build the world's biggest container port virtually from scratch. Yangshan port is this enormous deep water project that was built kind of on a fresh sheet of paper 
the biggest possible piece of infrastructure that they could possibly build to stamp Shanghai's kind of dominance over container shipping. The plan called for a true megastructure, a 20-kilometer key where 50 ships could dock at one time and a port that could process 25 million shipping containers in one year, 70,000 in just one day. Price tag, an estimated 18 billion US dollars. 2002, construction begins on Yangshan phase one. Engineers begin transforming these lonely islets into the world's biggest container port. It's like trying to, to you know, tie a, a butterfly knot in, a, in, a, in the middle of a raging river. You've got water that's flowing two meters a second. These guys are up against uh, typhoon, bad weather, fog. You know, they're 35 kilometers offshore. There's no power, there's no water. There's probably more inhospitable locations but there certainly isn't a tougher location to work in for such a big project. Failure is not an option, and neither is delay. Shanghai's container traffic is growing by 30% every year. To build Yangshan, engineers must create an artificial island with a 10 square kilometer port, bigger than 20,000 basketball courts. In ocean, 15 meters deep and that will take thousands of millions of cubic meters of soil how do you get it enter the sea dragon the mega dredge built in the Netherlands to clear Shanghai's monumental silt this is a dredge like no other when the sea dragon swings into action you can see how it got its name. Its two massive suction arms bear an uncanny resemblance to monsters of the deep. Ocean floor mud as deep as 45 meters can't escape their jaws. And they don't just eat a lot, they eat fast. Thanks to some mega power topside, in the belly of this beast, two turbocharged 12-cylinder diesel engines generate 9,000 kilowatts of power each. With that kind of power, the Sea Dragon only needs to pump one hour to fill its hopper with mud. In China, eight is a lucky number. So the Sea Dragon's hopper holds 12,888 cubic meters. That's over 200,000 kegs of beer. Once the hop is full, two gigantic pumps drain the water from over 12,000 cubic meters of mud. And Captain Yarn says that when it's time to deliver the payload, his dredge leads the pack. Older ships can only dump sand, but the Sea Dragon can blow or spray it. That gives it a real advantage over other ships on the construction site. The Sea Dragon worked almost a full year just to build Phase 1. Dumping 3,000 million cubic meters of mud. Enough to fill over a million Olympic swimming pools. growing a man-made island in ocean over 15 meters deep. The Sea Dragon's done its job, for now. But there are still two more phases of Yangshan to build, and they'll need 13 billion cubic meters of mud, enough to fill Loch Ness. Turning open sea into 10 square kilometers of world-class container port in under four years is pretty impressive. But Yangshan only proves itself when the world's biggest container ships come to call. Now, one of the biggest, the Gudrun Maersk, is ready to unload. 
and the port of Yangshan has to unload her 3,000 containers, reload her with 2,000 more, and send her on her way in just 20 hours. Over those 20 hours, Yangshan's state-of-the-art technology and the people who run and manage it must once again show the shipping world that they're among the best. Because in this high-stakes world, no matter how good you are, you're only as good as your last ship. Twelve noon, unloading the Gudrun Mursk begins. 3,000 shipping containers in less than 20 hours. Every hour behind schedule costs thousands of dollars. And takes you down a notch in the eyes of the shipping world. Only the best can pull this off. And Yangshan Deepwater Port has 13 of them. The STS-40 shipped ashore crane, 50 meters high. That's as tall as the fabled Godzilla. And they're manufactured right in the neighborhood, at the Zhenhua Company on Chungshing Island at the mouth of the Yangtze, only 125 kilometers from Yangshan. The biggest crane factory in the world. But even at this mega factory where mountains of metal seem to float on air, the Yangshan cranes were a tall order. Most container cranes can lift one 40-foot container at a time, or two 20-foot ones. Yangshan needed cranes that could lift twice that many and stand tall enough to reach them from atop the world's biggest ships. And it needed 13 of them. General Manager Lu Hanjong recalls the excitement of winning the Yangshan contract and the anxiety of fulfilling it. Designing and manufacturing cranes this big was a challenge for us because ships are getting bigger and higher. Cranes have to be bigger too. We couldn't simply make one of our smaller cranes twice as big. That crane would have been far too heavy to build. We needed to change the design of the whole structure. But one of the toughest challenges to giving Yangshan its super cranes wasn't building them. When they arrive at container ports, new cranes can need up to six months reassembly before they're ready to operate. But not Zhenhua's cranes. They come with no assembly required. Shipped around the world on Zhenhua's specially modified freighters. But Zhenhua's ships had never transported cranes as tall and heavy as the ones ordered by Yangshan. The cranes couldn't be any shorter or lighter, or Yangshan wouldn't beat its competition. There was only one option. Solve the problem. We successfully designed a bigger crane which doesn't add much to its own weight but can still do the job it's designed to do. And we designed them so they can lower their height while they're being transported. Problem solved. Cranes designed, built, and delivered. Now they're putting Yangshan ahead of the pack. Most container port cranes can handle about 30 containers an hour. Yangshan's cranes can handle more than 50. Thanks to crane drivers like Zhang Yi, who've made a commitment to being the best. The difficulty we have to conquer is we work on night and day shifts rather than normal working hours, so that we have to sacrifice a bit, personal life-wise. I mean, we cannot just go drinking and have fun as much as we want to. We have to make sure we rest well before we come to work. Driving a container port crane is like fishing for a prize in a carnival game. Except the prize weighs two and a half tons, and that's empty. Sitting in a cab meters up, the operator has to maneuver the crane's lifter, called a spreader, into position over each container, then lower it by eye and by hand. When the spreader's in place, he triggers the spreader's automated locks that grip the container and hoists it up and over the deck onto the dock below. 
lining it up precisely with the truck that will carry it away. And then do it again, and again, and again. And if you think unloading is tough, try loading. To load a ship, a crane operator has to position a 20-foot container onto pins on deck and slide it precisely into grooves built into the cargo hold so containers won't move at sea. That's like trying to set an elephant down on a coin from 50 meters up. And a crane driver doesn't have all day to get it right. If containers move too slowly, ship owners fall behind schedule and lose money. But if they move too fast, they can swing out of control, endangering cargoes, people and cranes. And a bumped container could mean damaged goods inside. So crane drivers have to develop an instinct for loading and unloading at exactly the right speed. The cranes put the containers onto trucks, which move them from the dock to the container yard. At the yard, rubber tire gantry cranes take the containers off the tractors and put them on the ground. But there's a lot more to this process than just heavy lifting. Shipping containers look alike, and unless you can match their numbers with a list, there's no way to tell them apart. From the moment they leave the Gudrun Maersk, 3,000 containers have to be precisely tracked. A misrouted container means unhappy customers and a bad reputation for Yong Shan. A lost container is unthinkable. But it's unthinkable thoughts like these that keep operations manager Shi Min Hua fully focused throughout his shift. More than anywhere, the burden of success or failure rests squarely on his shoulders. For the duration of his shift, he'll bear the ultimate responsibility for keeping the operation on time and on track. The port runs 24 hours. We are under a lot of pressure to work fast. But we try our best to fulfill our service promises to our customers. If anything does go wrong, the buck stops with Xi Min Hua. And there's plenty that could go wrong. Before a ship sails, the shipping company's computers analyze the contents and destinations of its several thousand containers and assign every container a specific place on board. In the first port, containers are the ones on top, and the last port's containers are on the bottom. It's a pretty complex mathematical equation. If port operators make a mistake or fall behind schedule, they might have to ask permission to load containers in places other than the ones the computer assigned them. And that's not a question a ship's captain wants to hear. Containers loaded in the wrong places will confuse unloading in the next port. Badly loaded containers could make the ship unstable on the open sea. And Yangshan's competitors, Hong Kong and Singapore, each handle over 20 million containers a year, with an error rate of less than 1%. All good reasons why no one at Yangshan wants to rock the boat. Fortunately, Yangshan has a brain to match its brawn. A cutting-edge control system developed by the port of Shanghai. The operation control room has a highly developed CCTV supervising system, which can help to detect any potential problems. We communicate through walkie-talkie. There are laptop computers on the wall that receive a detailed operation plan delivered by the computer system. Cranes, trucks and rubber tire gantry cranes all have cab displays electronically linked to the port control room. So crane operators and drivers know exactly which containers they're moving, when to move them, and where they go. The trucks receive wireless orders from the computer terminal in the operation control room. 
Portable mini computers in the trucks display instructions on what to do and where to go. The trucks we use here are some of the best. They are equipped to transport containers on the left and the right. And the driver's cab has windows on three sides, which allows the driver to see a lot more. The Yangshan system maximizes efficiency. Sending ship after ship back to sea on schedule. Making crews and owners happy. So they're trying to sail at a specific time to meet a, a berthing window at another port down the road. Delays are just not, you know, not, not acceptable. The unloading and loading goes on all night. And past the break of day. 20 hours after she docked, the Gudrun Mursk departs Yangshan. Leaving behind 3,000 containers filled with imported goods. Taking with her 2,000 others filled with exports. Shi Minhua and the Yangshan team can finally relax and call it a day. A very long day. But Yangshan's job isn't over yet. 3,000 shipping containers have to be delivered. Customers have waited weeks for the Gudrun Musk to bring them across the ocean. And now they're sitting on an island 32 kilometers out to sea. To compete with other world-class container ports, Yangshan must move over 20 million shipping containers per year. But how do you maintain your competitive edge when you're on an island in the middle of the ocean? You build another megastructure, the Donghai Bridge. Six lanes wide and 32 kilometers long. More than 12 times longer than the Golden Gate Bridge. The second longest ocean-spanning bridge in the world. The longest is just 80 kilometers to the west, spanning Hangzhou Bay. Building a bridge this long on land would be tough. Building it over the open sea is a logistical nightmare. It's not like you're a steel worker building a skyscraper. I mean, you don't have electricity out there. Everything that you need to do your job has to be taken in by barge and back and forth in, in that fashion. Just designing the Donghai Bridge was a mega challenge. It had to be wide enough for six lanes of truck traffic high enough to let some of the world's biggest ships sail underneath, and strong enough to withstand all that nature would routinely throw at it. Typhoons every summer, currents ripping past at two meters per second, six meter waves, and that's just on the surface. From the mainland to Yangshan Islands, the seabed can vary in depth from 10 to 30 meters. And it's nothing but soft, unstable mud. Not a good foundation for six lanes of concrete highway, vibrating with heavily laden trucks. In cyberspace, engineers tested their bridge designs every way they could. With waves, winds, truck accidents and colliding megaships. To discover which design would best survive. In the end, they chose not one design, but two. Most of Donghai is a box girder bridge made of over 600 concrete spans. The longest spans are the length of four volleyball courts. But in two places, it becomes a cable-stayed suspension bridge, with one span rising high enough to let ships pass underneath. And it spans the waters in a graceful S-curve. So ships passing under it can sail at angles to strong ocean currents. By 2002, engineers had a bridge that worked beautifully, on paper and in their computers. Now, they had to build it. First challenge, 
anchor kilometers of concrete in waterlogged mud, firmly enough to stand up in a typhoon. Engineers drove over 6,000 foundation piles into the sea floor. Positioning them with GPS and seven satellites within a three to five millimeter accuracy. 20 plus meters of water, then another 40 meters down below before they actually reached uh, bedrock. Next problem, how to build 600 concrete spans, some weighing over 2,000 tons. In the middle of a sea so rough, construction's possible only six months of the year. The solution was not to even try. Instead, the Donghai's builders pre-built its massive spans on land and towed them out to sea. I mean, it would be craziness to try to build the bridge, you know, piece by piece in that, in that position. And they had to actually, in the middle of the process, you know, actually construct this new barge with 1,600 uh, ton lifting capacity to move these bridge sections in a position. From start to finish, nothing was routine about building Donghai Bridge, including the workers' lives. As construction moved further out to sea, massive bridge pilings did double duty as dormitories. On 10 December 2005, 42 months after construction began, the Donghai Bridge opened to traffic. Since then, nearly three million containers have crossed its S-shaped span. Under the watchful eyes of bridge operators. From this high-tech control room, they miss nothing that happens on, over, and under the world's second longest ocean bridge. Their eyes, some 80 surveillance cameras placed along its 32 kilometer length. Electronic eyes that never close. And for good reason. The Donghai Bridge is a triumph of engineering over nature. But nature isn't giving in that easily. Typhoons and fog can make driving on the Donghai Bridge hazardous. In 2006, super typhoon Changchu battered China with powerful waves and winds. The bridge stood its ground. And by mid-2007, Yangshan had moved Shanghai from world's third biggest container port to number two. Only one million containers behind its rival Singapore. When it's completed in the year 2020, Yangshan Island will be the world's biggest container port. Its wharves stretching an awesome 20 kilometers, with berths for 50 ships, capable of handling 25 million shipping containers a year. No city has ever achieved what, what Shanghai has done with the Yangshan deep water port. It was a tremendously visionary uh, project. For the city fathers of Shanghai to actually create this um, over such a short time frame was tremendously far-sighted. It's a very emotional issue, I think, for everyone from the guy in the street, you know, the, to the city leadership, to the, to the country leadership. Um, they all know that, you know, Shanghai is the number one port in China, will be the largest container port in the world. And, you know, that's something that you don't see in Europe or the United States. For someone, you know, in Los Angeles versus Oakland saying, geez, we've got the biggest container port in the United States, they don't know <laughs> and they probably don't care. But here, it's something that everyone knows about and it's something that they're intensely proud of achieving. But shipping companies are already designing even bigger container ships. Mega ships that will demand even longer docks, bigger cranes, and deeper water. The biggest container port ever built may someday be just the first phase of an even bigger one.